as well that was all slated for development like so much of the land is around here. You can look around and, and see what it might have become. But the foundation wanted to preserve it if at all possible. And through the, the owners, the McCann uh, family, uh, were willing to work with us to preserve it and we found a way to do it. Uh, they reduced the price significantly below the appraised value which allowed us to use grants and your donations to have a path forward to saving it. It's, it's really almost a miracle that this land is saved. And hopefully as time goes on, it'll look more and more like a battlefield now that it, currently it's mostly a cow pasture. But thank you again for all your support and uh, keep watching us in the future as we try to make this a real battlefield. Okay, can everybody hear me? Okay. Sounds good. Thanks so much. My name is Scott Mingus. I'm from York, Pennsylvania. I uh, had a chance to, a few years ago, work with my good friend uh, Eric Wittenberg and write a book on the Second Battle of Winchester. You know how difficult it is to write a book on a battlefield when one of the key parts of the battlefield you can't walk on? Okay. I, can, I have to stand at this fence with a telephoto lens and kind of imagine what it would have been like and told my wife, if I had any guts, I would have crossed the fence and walked around here, but and I don't want to be in a Virginia jail. <laughs> Trespassing is not my suit. So now we finally get to come on the property to begin with. Let's step back in time. It's June, 1863, Winchester, Virginia, typical. Valley Turnpike Town. The United States Army's put 8,000 troops in and around Winchester, three divisions of the 4th Corps, commanded by this fella, Robert Houston Milroy. He's an Indiana politician. He's not a professionally trained soldier. He's a Republican. He's a good friend of Abraham Lincoln. One thing Milroy does right is he befriends the great politicians. And when Abraham Lincoln is elected at the Chicago Democratic or Republican Convention, it's Robert Milroy and his good friend Oliver Morton, the governor, soon to be governor of Indiana, deliver Indiana for Lincoln. Lincoln never forgets this. Lincoln's the ultimate politician. And so he rewards his friend Robert Milroy with political patronage appointments. By 1863, Robert Milroy is a major general in the United States Army. As mentioned, he's got 8,000 men in and around Winchester, but they haven't been doing much fighting. In fact, they've been here since January of 1863, and other than scattered small little patrols of Confederate cavalry, you haven't seen an enemy soldier. This is the back water of the war. In fact, Winchester is considered such an unlikely target by Milroy that he allows many of the men and officers to bring their wives, their families, their sweethearts to Winchester. He kicks out a number of the pro-Confederate people from their houses, takes over their homes, and puts his own officers in Winchester's civilian houses. Brings down settlers from places like York, Pennsylvania, where I live today bring settlers in from Delaware, in fact, so that the men have familiar food, familiar surroundings. That all changes in mid-June of 1863, when Robert Milroy is going to find to a shock on June 12, 1863, that a Confederate cavalry patrol south of Winchester on the Valley Turnpike has been ambushed by 87th Pennsylvania Infantry in a battery of regular artillery. Prisoners from that fight are brought to Milroy, and they tell them they're from the Army of Northern Virginia. Now, the Army of Northern Virginia is not supposed to be anywhere near Winchester, Virginia. Last time they were spotted, elements of it are near Brandy Station, down near Culpeper, and the rest of the Army is believed to be still at Fredericksburg. No, no, no. One third of the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia 
is now in Winchester, en route, coming here. <laughs> the very next morning, on June 13, 1863, Milroy starts receiving a flurry <coughs> of messages from the United States government. His commander's in Baltimore, and his commander's commander is in Washington, D.C. at the War Department. And you can imagine the delay in sending military messages from Washington to Baltimore and eventually through Harper's Ferry to Winchester. Milroy start, doesn't get this flurry of messages until later in the day. And those messages include a warning from his friend, Abraham Lincoln, to General Shank in Baltimore, get Milroy out of Winchester, the news is tightening because the U.S. Army War uh, Intelligence now says a fight at Winchester is imminent. This is not a defendable town. Winchester's got way too many modes of access, way too many ways the Confederate Army could approach Winchester. And Milroy, on the 13th, the battle begins, Second Battle of Winchester. It's a three-day battle, by the way. It's the second largest battle of the Gettysburg campaign, the entire campaign. It's also a three-day battle like Gettysburg. Day one of the battle starts where Kernstown, Virginia is. They're gonna fight in and around the Pritchard Farm and they're going to march almost a mile northward as the Confederates continue to drive Milroy's men backwards. 12th West Virginia, 12th Pennsylvania Cavalry, 116th Ohio, 122nd, 123rd Ohio, all pushed back until two Ohio regiments will finally stop the Confederate advance, as does nightfall. June 13th goes into the books. But Milroy stubbornly decides, I'm not leaving town. I'm gonna stand and fight. And on June 14th, Sunday afternoon, Milroy's pulled most of his men back into a fortification south of town and several forts on the north and northwest of town. Milroy, believing that Winchester's really not the target. Remember I said, Winchester has always been considered an undefensible town. Milroy believes the real action is going to happen at Harper's Ferry several miles up this way. That's where, and he's convinced the Confederates are gonna bypass no, uh, his, his troops at Winchester, and they're going to move towards Harper's Ferry. He's wrong. The Confederates wanna attack Winchester. They wanna attack Milroy a second day. And on Sunday, June 14th, 1863, Milroy's troops are gonna suffer yet another disaster. He's going to lose forts west of town, West Fort, Battery Number no. 6, both fall of the Confederates. And again, only darkness stops the Confederates from totally overwhelming Milroy's men. That brings us to here. At 2 o'clock in the morning of Monday, June 15th, 1863, Bob Milroy finally finally decides maybe the War Department was right. Maybe I should get out of Dodge. Milroy abandons his wounded, abandons the women and children that have been coming down here, abandons much of his own soldiers that are sick in the hospitals. And Milroy decides, I'm going to bail. And they start walking out of the forts to the northwest of town. Where is my net? There it is. Back here. Now, while this is going on, somebody else thinks Milroy's movement is going to happen. His name is Edward Johnson. He commands one division of the Confederate Army. Edward Johnson decides, you know, Milroy's going to try to slip out during the night. And he's going to try to beat Milroy to the punch. Because Milroy thinks, again, there are big attacks coming at Harper's Ferry. He also knows that Martinsburg, and you guys know where Martinsburg, West Virginia is. Martinsburg is gone. The Confederates have taken Martinsburg. Robert Rhodes' entire division 
is sitting in Martinsburg. That road's blocked. It's only one way to Harper's Ferry. Anybody know that, how to get to Harper's Ferry from here? You get down to the Charlestown Road. Make a right turn on the Charlestown Road and start heading towards Harper's Ferry. That's Milroy's intention. And Johnson correctly says that's what Milroy's going to do. <laughs> so now it's going to be a foot race in the middle of the night. Who can get to that intersection first? If Milroy can get there and make a right turn, he's going to try to head to Harper's Ferry. If he can't make the right turn down there, God bless him because he's not going north. Not easily. So Milroy's got this problem that continues to develop here. Now, one of Milroy's men in the 10th Virginia, Corporal Theodore Locke, talks about this march. The night was a starlit one. The roads were mostly hidden in the shade of big overhanging trees. The boys, these Virginians, were on edge from the start, for they intuitively felt that something peculiar and important was ahead of them. What's ahead of them? Beating the Yankees to this intersection. Well, the Union forces, Milroy's <laughs> abandoned his artillery, left every single cannon back in Winchester for the Confederates, threw, spiked the guns, you know, hammered iron spikes into them to prevent them to be used by the uh, Confederates, dumped the ammunition down wells, and now he's marching his men, his fighting soldiers at least, on the Martinsburg Pike behind us. With that, let's go to our next stop. Tell your friends what you do today. I walked a cow pasture in Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> Not different any other. Don't fall off that stage, Scott. No, I probably will in a second. Actually, that's a good point. Maybe I'll just go <laughs> <laughs> see. This is a witness rock, by the way. <laughs> You've heard about witness trees? They have witness rocks. Yeah, Terry bought the rock and got the field. <laughs> there are any Irish groups here? I've seen lots of patties. Yeah, we're going to talk about that a little bit. Okay. That's a good one. I like that. Can you guys hear me back there? Or should I start? All right. So, Martinsburg Pike, right down there. Can't see it today because of all the trees. But there were trees here at the time of the battle. They weren't so overgrown. There was a widow lady by the name of Susan Pittman Carter who lived back over there. She owned this wood lot which stretched all the way down through here and got thicker on the other side of Charlestown Road. It was called Carter's Woods, of course, for the lady. Now, Civil War parlance. Terry and I will tell you this is the second Battle of Winchester. All one activity. But back to the soldiers, many of them considered this to be a separate battle, not part of Second Winchester. They consider this, the Union forces called this the Battle of Carter's Woods for the woodlot. The Confederates, who tended to do more things by geographic nomenclature, called this the Battle of Stevenson Depot because of their train station down the road here on the Winchester Potomac Railway was called Stevenson's Depot for a local farmer by the name of Stevenson. Which I think is on the map on the back. You can see Stevenson's Depot. So, the fighting here at Carter's Woods starts at about 3 30 in the morning. On the Martinsburg Pike, Union troops from the 143rd Ohio Infantry from Fremont, Ohio, home of Rutherford B. Hayes. The 123rd Ohio is stunned with three separate volleys. It's 3 to 3.30 in the morning. It's dark. No way do they have any clue. They're walking down the turnpike and off to the right comes three volleys of Confederate infantry fire. 123rd is hit right away, as is the 18th Connecticut. The chaplain of the 18th Connecticut, William Walker, will write this. 
This was a murderous trap, which was not seen in the gray dawn of that fatal morning. And it was first discovered by the flash of rebel rifles. You think you're walking to Harper's Ferry. There's no rebels out here. The rebels are in Winchester. Oh no, they're not. Because Allegheny Johnson has beaten Milroy to the touch. Down here at Stevenson's Bridge, the elements of the 12th Pennsylvania Cavalry are now engaged down there. Now the 18th Connecticut and the 87th Pennsylvania are being hit here. And the 123rd Ohio, all being hit. And nobody knows what's going on. The commander, Robert Milroy, rides up somewhere along the Martinsburg Pike, and Milroy tells the 123rd Ohio, go take the rebels. 123rd Ohio, almost unsupported, comes basically from right about where that pool is, somewhere down in there, they're going to charge in front of where we are and come down and try to hit the Confederates. Now what's behind them are an entire Confederate brigade, actually two brigades, of Allegheny Johnson's men. Remember this guy? Allegheny Johnson. The troops that are back here are from Louisiana. And beside them are troops from Virginia, North Carolina, and Maryland. These guys are pretty good troops. Now, obviously not the greatest shots of that distance because there's not a lot of soldiers that are shot real early in this battle. You know, that's long range to the turnpike. So all you're really doing is just rattling your muskets a little bit, creating consternation. But as soon as the 123rd Ohio starts getting to this high ground, what do you think happens to them? They start taking casualties right here in these fields on this high ground. Because on the back side of that, they're fairly well sheltered. They've got a long way they can advance before they worry about enemy fire. But they get up here, look at that line of trees. That's the railroad. That's an easy shot for guys down in that tree as soon as they come up. The only thing that saves most of these troops is it's still dark. And the Yankees are wearing what kind of clothing? Dark blue. So they don't make real good targets in the dawn. And if you notice, they're not really high up and they can be silhouetted very well. So again, the fighting is really more about formations at this point in time. 123rd Ohio is pretty much beaten back at this point in time. Milroy decides, let's try it again. Let's go on down here. Civil War bus reminds me of a cross country race. So you all string out. <laughs> Same way, so you always wait for folks. He had his personal best, by the way. He did uh, three miles in 20 minutes, so he was, he was flying. For him, he was flying. He was pleased. He opposed the horse for watching. Okay, so what are you worried about? She's straight ahead of us. You guys see where the, the white car just went? That's the Charlestown Road. And on down to the left of that is the Martinsburg Pike. It's that intersection that now is the key to the battlefield. Who controls that intersection? The Confederates are going to put guns down in there. Artillery pieces. The bridge is real small. They're going to get one cannon on the bridge. So they bring the rest of the artillery in and they're going to be back over here about where the power lines are and off to the left and off to the right. They're going to bring in more artillery. Now right down here brings in more troops. So if you look at your maps that I gave uh, Terry passed out, just to give you an idea of where you're at. You see where the 18th Connecticut is? This is actually the third attack, second attack is on the map. Milroy is going to try a big attack. Rather than a piecemeal attack, he's going to try one big assault. So he lines up, as you can see there, 18th Connecticut. Lines up the 87th Ohio, 123rd Ohio. And they're going to try one more time. The 5th Maryland doesn't want to charge again. The men of the 5th Maryland are like, we've had enough. And the Lieutenant Colonel Monroe Nichols 
turns the men around at the Martinsburg Pike and the 5th Maryland starts marching away. To which one of the sharp commanders here, a guy named John Shaw, I got his picture. John Shaw, York, Pennsylvania, 87th Pennsylvania Infantry. John Shaw decides this is uncoordinated, this is a wreck, train wreck happening. John Shaw jumps off her on his horse, goes galloping after the 5th Maryland, finds Lieutenant Colonel Nichols and says, Where in the heck are you going? I need you here. Follow me, boys! And the 5th Maryland turns around. And they're going to join belatedly the attack that's coming here. 12th West Virginia, 116th Ohio, are being held in reserve at this point in time. By now, it's probably 4 o'clock in the morning or so, still dark. But waves of Union soldiers are now coming across this field. The 18th Connecticut, this is going to be hard to see. The 18th Connecticut's chaplain, William Walker, later writes a book about what happens here and he includes the only known drawing ever done that I can find of the McCann property during 2nd Winchester. It shows the field that we're in right now with the line of Confederates in the trees blazing away. And I'll pass this around to you guys in a minute. Well, what's amazing about this picture, this is 1863. What year are we in today? 2021. This field is still a field. Those woods along the railroad tracks are still woods. Carter's woods back here are still woods. I will submit to you, where's Terry? Back here. I will submit to you, Terry, that Shenandoah Valley Field, Valley Battlefields Foundation has bought one of the most pristine Civil War battlefields you can ever imagine. This is what we're not doing massive amounts of tree clearing, unlike Gettysburg. This is it. Woods, field, woods, railroad tracks. This is the battlefield. All the way down. Now, that section by the way needs some clearing sometime. But for now, we're in pretty good shape. This attack is another disaster. They get up in here and they start losing more men. And again, confused orders. Because where's Bob Milroy in all this? He's in the Martinsburg Pike. Now he's the commander of the division, but I'll suggest to you many division commanders led from closer to their troops than Bob Milroy did on this night. He's way back on the highway. He finally decides to ride up a little bit, just in time for this attack to fail. And these men come shooting back. And at one point, as they're coming back in, Chaplain Walker in 18th Connecticut. The Union forces could see nothing as they charged into the woods behind us and up the crossroad, Pearl Sound Road. Hence, the rebels had every advantage and were not slow to improve it. Because all along the railroad tracks, they piled fence rails and backpacks and knapsacks and boxes and anything they can. This is a virtual fortress. That's a six foot deep railroad embankment lined with fence rails. You think the Yankees can shoot anybody down there in the dark? Not really. So the Confederates have another huge advantage and they keep shooting men back. Now, somewhere along in here, the 18th Connecticut men will be stunned because they're going to see Milroy now suddenly frantically telling them, one more try boys, let's try it again. So Milroy decides, I'm going to try a grand attack. I think the Confederate flank is right out here somewhere. So here's what I'm going to do. Milroy decides they're going to take two Ohio regiments north of the Charlestown uh, Road. I'm going to, in the middle, I'm going to try all these guys again. And by now their brigade commander, William Eli, has finally arrived on the scene. And Eli is going to take personal charge of this part of the battlefield. He's never commanded a brigade in his life until just a month before this, or two months before this. 
William Eli. William Eli is a good soldier. He's not capable of leading a brigade in the darkness. Never did it in the daylight under combat. Eli starts leading the men forward in a third charge. The third charge through here is the most chaotic one of the bunch. Because by now all cohesion is broken down. These guys are just simply gangs of men with guns moving forward in the darkness. Desperately trying to figure out who's left, who's to your right, who's here. And a third attack in the darkness is going to fail. Slipping down to our left, down the Can Road, comes two more Union Infantry regiments. The 67th Pennsylvania and the 6th Maryland. Late arrivals. They finally get here. Fronted by the 13th Pennsylvania Cavalry. Remember the Cal Patty joke? The 13th Pennsylvania Cavalry is called the Irish Dragoons. They're Irishmen. They're on their way here, but that's way down there. And the left is over here. So these guys are not going to come into this field. The 5th and 6th Maryland and the 67th Pennsylvania are going to keep marching down that road. We'll talk about them in a few minutes. Let's go this way. Is your co-author here too? What's that? Is your co-author? Mm -hmm. No, Eric lives in Columbus, Ohio. It's okay. a little far for him. Yeah. Okay. We're not going down where I originally was going to go down because it's going to be fresh cow patty. <laughs> so we're going to stop here. Good. Charlestown Road, where that white car, silver car just went. Intersections. Now that's not that high during the Civil War. That's because the modern road goes much higher than the original road did. The foundations of the old Civil War bridge are still there if it's private property. So on the modern bridge, you can still pull over, walk to the modern bridge, and look down at the railroad tracks. And again, if you look at your map, you'll see that George Stewart's brigade, 3rd North Carolina, 10th Virginia, etc., are down in there. But that cannon on that bridge can sweep the field. There's more artillery back up here. Again, behind the tree line in 1863 with the great, great artillery platform. You can blast into this field with almost no problem whatsoever. And so this final attack has met with failure. Somewhere down in there, the 87th Pennsylvania, the 18th Connecticut, the 5th Maryland and the 123rd Ohio all record the same instance, the same incident. How many of you have studied Civil War battles before? Keep your hands up if you know of any case in the American Civil War where the commander on the field left his men. Chickamauga. Chickamauga, exactly. Good pick. Yep, Chancellorville also happened. Chicken Mark is my next book, so the right answer. <laughs> but, in the, but until that point, that's in September. In June of 1863, that's unheard of. And those four regiments all record the same thing. Bob Milroy gathers his staff together, and they flee off the field. Milroy runs away here. Now, what was he thinking? Some will say he was scared to death. Others will say he was just trying to find reinforcements. Some will say he was trying to lead his men to Harper's Ferry, follow me, boys. Other accounts will suggest he's shell-shocked. His men have been shot to pieces. He's lost cohesion of the battlefield. Nothing's going right for him, and Morroy's just Scatterbrained, just does flee. You know, the old psychologist will tell you flee or fight. He flees. Mm. That leaves Colonel Eli in charge with William Tecumseh. Finish it. Sherman. No, William Tecumseh Wilson. <laughs> Not William Tecumseh Sherman. William Tecumseh Wilson. Born in Pennsylvania, lives in Ohio. 
He now, again, some men rise to the occasion. Wilson's one of them. It's him on the first day of the battle who led a counterattack personally with untried troops that had never fired a shot. He charges the famed Louisiana Tigers and stops them in the tracks on the first day of this battle. Now out here, Wilson takes command, him and Eli. Eli, when I say takes command, is probably, let's just say organizationally. What really happens at the tail end of this battle is Wilson takes over out here. Colonel the 123rd Ohio's had enough. Tells everybody, see that bridge? Take the bridge. I don't care how, take the bridge. And Union regiments from the Martinsburg Pike through that area down through there where the cows now are. But they start charging that intersection. It is again a mess. The cannon crew on the bridge, Confederate gunners, every single man gets shot. Only two men are still able to work that last gun by the time the fighting's here. The only monument ever built on the second Winchester battlefield is down at the Methodist Church, down at the, the crossroads, down near Stevenson. Showing, if you look at it closely, it'll show that cannon on the bridge and the monuments to their commander, Lieutenant Colonel Snowden Andrews. Who commands the Confederate artillery here. This guy does a really good job. He's not going to fight at Gettysburg, though, because he's going to get shot here at 2nd Winchester, and he's going to miss Gettysburg. Any of you guys study the Gettysburg battlefield? He's going to turn over command to a second command, a major named Latimer, who's going to fight on Benner's Hill and be mortally wounded at Gettysburg because his commander, Snowden Andrews, is now out of commission because of 2nd Winchester. So that's another Gettysburg connection. And Andrew's gunners and his men are now finding it difficult to shoot the Yankees because they're, again, down on manpower. And the Yankees make one last run for the bridge, and they fail. The bridge is never taken. Let's go this way. The position, if you look on your map, again of the Louisiana Brigade. You look here. We are looking. Republican in the Pennsylvania State Senate, who will spend the rest of the Civil War in Richmond in a prisoner of war camp. Much to the delight of the Confederates to have a United States sitting state senator now under wraps, Major Harry White. All this fighting that goes on here, if you look back across the field, again, you get a great view of the field the Yankees had to try to cross get over here. This is a nighttime attack. Would it have worked in the day? I don't think so. Because we've all seen Pickett's Charge, right? This is not as far as Pickett's Charge, but this position here is incredibly difficult to dislodge because the Confederates are down in that ravine there. It's been built up again over the years, so you don't get the same look as you would have during the Civil War. 
but this is, again is an ugly, ugly position for them to try to take. And now, right about where we were just standing behind us, again if you look at your map, Johnson's last brigade, the Stonewall Brigade, that Stonewall Jackson had commanded earlier in the war, is late arriving to the battlefield. They're going to sweep onto the battlefield, divide up. Some of the regiments are going to come down here into this field where we're just standing. And they're going to hit the Yankees who are disorganized in that field. And there's not much the Yankees can do. They're tired. They've been marching at 2 o'clock in the morning. They haven't slept all night. And they melt. And all of a sudden, the woods behind us become filled with disorganized mobs of Union soldiers heading across the Martinsburg Pike. Milroy's gone. William Tecumseh Wilson has no control out here. He's trying hard, but everything disintegrates at that point in time. And about 700 or so yards north of the turnpike, well, west of the turnpike, Colonel Eli in his first battle. Remember Colonel Eli? This dude. Remember him? Colonel Eli turns to one of his men, gets a white rubberized poncho, and in a symbol that every soldier understands, waves the white poncho in the air. We're done. We're done. Lay down your arms, boys. We're done. 18th Connecticut drops their weapons. 87th Pennsylvania drops their weapons. Much of the 5th Maryland drops their weapons. Notice the flag on the picture on your map that says surrender site. That's on the color map. And they're pretty much done. But there's still fighting still going on out here. One last stop over here. You guys see those cars down there? Very late in the action here. The final act of what happens here is the 13th Pennsylvania Cavalry. Irishman, Major Michael Kilroy, uh, yeah, where is he? Major Michael Kerwin, commander of the 13th Pennsylvania Cavalry. Kerwin decides he's going to make a charge under orders from his commander, the brigade commander, Colonel Andrew McReynolds. This is the brigade commander who commands the last of the troops to arrive here. 6th Maryland, 67th Pennsylvania, 13th, uh, 13th, uh, I can't talk, Pennsylvania Cavalry, and the 1st New York Cavalry. McReynolds is West Point. He doesn't like Bob Milroy. He's lagged behind, probably deliberately, I'll give you because he kind of worries what's going to happen. He's not going to try for that road down there at Harper's Ferry. No, no, no. Not this guy. In West Point, if your road's blocked, what do you do? Find another way to go. McCann's Road. So he's taking his men down through there. The 67th Pennsylvania has never fired a shot in their life. They get tired. And at the Easter Farm across from Milburn Cemetery, there are shady trees. What do you want to do if you're hot and tired and you're maybe a little scared? We're going to stay in the trees, right? And the 67th Pennsylvania has captured almost like 80% of their men. But the 6th Maryland, the one regiment here on this field that's had a fair amount of combat experience, guided by Colonel McReynolds, what do you think they do? They make it to Harper's Ferry. They're going to make it to safety, as will some of the Ohioans, and scattered elements of all the men that fight out here. The 13th Pennsylvania is trying to buy time because the guns are now up here. Now we see the Confederate reinforcements here on the hill, and they charge them. That's a bad move because it's not going to work out here either. And in fact, uh, where is it? Officer dashed in among us. 
the, the horsemen, gave orders for every man to get away as best as he could. This order ended all discipline, and away we went, every one looking out for himself. I don't know how far the 13th Pennsylvania gets, but it's not much farther than where we're at. Somewhere up in here, a United States Cavalry Regiment disintegrates, and the 13th Pennsylvania becomes every Irish man for himself. Can you imagine a bunch of Irishmen tired, her, deciding we're going to outrace each other back to safety? We left the field of battle farther and farther behind it, the noise becoming less and less until it died out altogether. Though we thus continued to madly dash on, but to where we didn't know. We only had one object in view, and that was to escape the enemy. As men flee here, the surrenders are popping up back over there and behind us. This will become more than 4,000 United States soldiers' final day in uniform, at least for a while. They're going to be taken prisoner. Percentage wise, percentage wise, this is the worst number, highest percentage of Union soldiers, American soldiers, United States soldiers, captured until Corregidor in World War II, Carter's Woods. Do you guys know that? Yeah. This is it. I thought it was Harper's Ferry. No, that's 1862. That happened oh. before this. Well, this Harper's, and, Harper's Ferry was sheer number. This is yeah. the percentage. This is, but, but this is also after Harper's Ferry. Right. So let me clarify. From this point on, yeah. the next biggest disaster in terms of percent captured is Corregidor. So this field's important. That's why SVDF spent four million bucks to buy this ground. This is the gateway to Gettysburg because the Confederate commanders are now flushed with so much confidence. They think they can beat the world. And two weeks later, on the farm fields of Adams County, Pennsylvania, almost every man that's here in the Confederate uniform is going to fight again. They're going to fight again. And one third of the Confederates who are here in the railroad cut, who are on this hill, who are back over there defending the tracks in the ridge, one third of them will become casualties at Gettysburg. For Bob Milroy's men, this is the end of the line. Milroy himself is going to go to Harper's Ferry. He's going to catch a train. He's going to go to Baltimore to see his commander. And he's going to tell his commander, Look what we did. We delayed the entire Confederate Army for three days. We did great, didn't we? And his commander is going to say, guess what, dude? You're under arrest <laughs> for incompetence. <laughs> Milroy doesn't believe him. So you know what he does? What does any good United States Army Major General do when he's under arrest? He gets on a train and rides to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania to go find the governor of Pennsylvania to appeal to him. Why? We're in Winchester, Virginia. The men that survived this battle and are not captured, you know what they're going to do? They're either going to walk to Harper's Ferry, or what many of them do, is they're going to walk to Berkeley Springs, West Virginia, or Hancock, Maryland. You ever walk there from Winchester? <clears throat> oh, you're not done. Oh, no, you're not done. Once you get to Berkeley Springs or Hancock, no, no, no. You're going to walk to one of three locations. Everett, Pennsylvania, that's west of Chambersburg. Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, or York, Pennsylvania, where I'm from. Men who def and the 87th Pennsylvania, who attacked Carter's Woods here, will defend the world's longest covered bridge on Sunday night, June 28, 1863, when John Gordon's Georgians will attack the world's longest covered bridge. They walk from Winchester to the Susquehanna River. Anybody ever did that? <laughs> I know Scott probably did, or maybe Terry. Not sure. Sure, some of you guys might have. Bob Milroy has met with disaster out here. It's been a total chaos. Just to give you an idea, by the way, Back here, 67th Pennsylvania, 17 men dead, 38 wounded, 400 surrendered. 
Only 117 men escaped Carter's Woods, the eastern farm behind us. Only 117. In the 87th Pennsylvania that night, 32 men show up. The rest of them are scattered to the wind, heading toward Pennsylvania. This is a major disaster. Milroy will unsuccessfully try to get his command back. He will never get this command back. This division will cease to exist as of this day, never to be reconstituted. Some of the men are incorporated in the Union Six Corps later in the war. They're going to fight in 1863 at the Mine Run campaign later this year. They're going to fight a monocacy in 1864. But Milroy himself finally gets Abraham Lincoln in 1864 to give him one last command. Bob Milroy is put out in Tennessee to guard railroad bridges in the backwoods of Tennessee, where Bob Milroy will have his one shining moment when he will become the only United States general in the Civil War to beat Nathan Bedford Forrest in a one-on-one -on -one fight. Milroy actually wins a battle in Tennessee. Many years later, Bob Milroy comes back to Winchester. Now, when Milroy left here, he had a wagon load of personal supplies that he had taken from the Logan Mansion in downtown Winchester across from the Hanley Library. He abandoned that, but the citizens of Winchester discovered that the Logan's silverware is in that wagon. So, when Bob Milroy comes back here, he makes two big mistakes after the Civil War. Number one, he's here to stump for a Republican for president. That's a problem. Down here in Democratic Winchester. And number two, who do you think the candidate is that he's backing openly in Winchester, Virginia, for president of the United States? U.S. Grant, the commander of the Union armies. And Bob Milroy makes a political speech and the good folks of Winchester, according to lore and legend, who knows, but according to some accounts, the people of Winchester silently start raising arms in the air with spoons and forks and knives to remind Milroy of what you did here. You left with our silverware. We beat you out here at Carter's Woods. Robert Milroy will survive the Civil War, he will go on to Seattle, Washington, will become incredibly wealthy. As he's dying years later, he calls his kids and his wife around him, and he tells them, I want to be buried in my full dress uniform with the sword I carried at Winchester. And oh, by the way, make sure my grandchildren and everyone else knows we saved Pennsylvania. Because those three days that we delayed the Confederates of Winchester, Virginia, bought enough time for the Army of the Potomac to arrive in Pennsylvania. And there wouldn't have been a battle at Gettysburg or a victory on Northern soil by the Union Army if it hadn't been for me and my men at Winchester, Virginia. Bob Milroy dies believing that. I will submit to you as a native of Zanesville, Ohio, 122nd Ohio fought over there, and a now living in York, Pennsylvania, I will tell you today the descendants of 122nd Ohio, the descendants of the 87th Pennsylvania, will still tell you a three days save Pennsylvania because they want to know that their sacrifice here was not for anything. With that, let's hear it for Terry at SVBF for buying this property. We thank you so very much for that. We would encourage you, the job is not done, because as I mentioned two or three times, on the other side of that railroad tracks is the Easter Farm. That's where the 6th Maryland makes its escape. That's where the 67th Pennsylvania meets its demise. That property still needs to be bought at some point in the future. The land north of the Charlestown Pike is not purchased by the SVBF. That's mostly private property, right, Terry? Still. So there's still much to do at 2nd Winchester. There's also big chunks of this battle field down in Winchester itself that still need to be preserved. So I would encourage you, tonight, tomorrow, during the next week, whenever you get time, you get an extra $5 or $10 or put a few zeros behind it, 
make out a check to the Shenandoah Valley Battlefields Foundation because hopefully you've enjoyed today. I volunteer my time in driving down from York, Pennsylvania for you guys today. And if you have any appreciation for all of us, give Terry a donation at some point. You know, let's, let's preserve more battlefield so we can come back here in a year or two and celebrate yet another victory at Second Winchester. Thanks, Terry. Right. Thank you. On behalf of my co-author, Eric Wittenberg, my publisher, Sabbath Stanley, thank you very much. I have four and only four copies of the book left with me. You can buy it at the Visitor Center. So if you hustle back to the battlefield, can you make it back to the visitor center in time? Yeah, it's open till five. So they got lots of copies of my book down there. If you're interested in buying a copy, I'll actually go down there and I'll sign them down there as well. Or if you want one of the copies here, first floor, get them. Otherwise, uh, go to the visitor center. But I will be going to the visitor center later before it closes. So if anybody wants to meet me there, I will uh, sign books there. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Yeah. For One being last instruction. Hey, guys. One last thing. Terry, I'll, I'll do it. When you leave here, unless anybody want to go left on 11, if you want to go left on 11, do not make a right turn out of here. You know, it's much better to go down here and make a left turn, go down to the end of McCann's Road. You can't miss it. It's going to T bone into Milburn Road. Make a left on Milburn Road. You'll see the old Milburn Cemetery, which was established well before the Civil War. Methodist Cemetery back there. You also see what's left of the Easter Farm. Keep going on Milburn Road, all the way down to the Charlestown Road. On your left-hand side, you will see a, a Civil War Trails marker for 2nd Winchester. If you got time, and there's not a gaggle of people, which there probably will be, stop and view that. Make a left turn on Charlestown Road, cross over the bridge, modern bridge, recognizing that's where the artillery piece was on the Civil War bridge that was right to your right. Uh, you can't see it as you look down. Well, you'll come out at a traffic light where you can make a left or a right no. turn. So we want to get you the traffic light. So. If you go to 11 this way, there is no light. You're There's no light. It's going to be a nightmare making a left turn off McCann. So if you're going to make a left turn, go this way. If you're going to make a right turn on to 11 and go north, fine. Otherwise, go this way. Thanks again for your time.